Before we get to today's podcast, I want to remind you about another great ESPN podcast, the Woj Pod. Every week, Woj chats with the newsmakers in and around the NBA, players, coaches, executives, and more. Download and subscribe to the Woj Pod and the right time wherever you get your podcast. 2020 is going to be the year you get it together, right? Join that gym, start that diet. <laughs> nah, you're not going to do that. But how about getting out of that job and into a career, a career in information technology? There are millions of unified cybersecurity positions in the U.S. right now, and my computer career is training people to help fill them. No IT experience or education? No problem. It's not rocket science. It's mycomputercareer.edu. Go to mycomputercareer.edu and take the free career evaluation today. You can start your new life as an information technology professional in months, not years. Attend classes on campus or live online just a few times a week to get what you'll need to start your new career. More than just a school, My Computer Career helps you get into the industry by working with hundreds of employers that hire our students. My Computer Career is nationally accredited and financial aid is available for those who qualify, including the GI Bill. Classes start soon, so make New Year, New Career your resolution and take the free career evaluation today at mycomputercareer.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening. Wherever you get your podcast, rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are, in fact, a hater. It's that time of week where we do an interview. Had a national championship game in college football a couple days ago, so we are on now with the best college football writer in America. Check him out at BannerSociety.com. His name is Spencer Hall, and, well, we lived long enough to see it, Ed Ogeron national champion and like american darling american darling just basically a a little over 10 years removed from being a laughing stock at old miss and the cajun cookie monster now uh, a legend and a title holder in his own right i am most overjoyed by his celebration of this which was to eat a ham sandwich (laughs) yeah because i think one thing people don't realize about ogeron is that he has been sober for 20 years so, like, uh-huh. this version of Ed Ogeron is actually the quite toned-down version of Ed Ogeron. By the way, that also means the sober version of Ed Ogeron is the one who allegedly challenged his whole team to fight in his first meeting with him at Ole Miss. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. I want you to think about every Ed Ogeron story you've ever heard. And I want you to remember that if you heard one from the last 20, 25 years, then you're hearing one from a man who has been stone-cold sober for over two decades. I believe that includes... <laughs> the time that he went out and was working out on the field before practice at 4.30 a.m. and was asked in an article by David Hale on ESPN.com, was asked by another assistant coach, hey, man, you're in great shape. Why are you out here at 4.30? And Ed Ogeron looked at him and said, the day I can't whip a man's ass is the day I stay in bed. There it was, right there. Who says that? The answer, Ed Ogeron. I am stunned by this, though. And I also, like, the USC people that are like, that could have been our coach. No, 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 no. He could have been your coach, but that couldn't have been your coach. It doesn't go no, that no. way if he's at uh-huh. USC. In large part, because USC don't spend money like this, right? Like, the Dabo Ed Ogeron model of CEO hinges heavily on spending all the money in the world on everything else. Oh, oh, very much so. In fact, consider this, that not only did you see three highlight videos from LSU's well moneyed well-put-together video department, you also got a football team that managed to go out and hire two offensive coordinators. Mind you, that same offense, many people blame for LSU lingering in the Stone Age for years, that offensive coordinator still sitting right next to the new guy, by the way. <laughs> it's a neat trick. You didn't, you know, you didn't get rid of the manager. You just hired another manager. You hired Joe Brady. And in addition to that, they managed to actually hire some analytics guys, right? Weird. They hired five or six analytics guys, and suddenly they end up being a lot better. Yeah, LSU spent this money, but let's, let's also consider context here. Hey, USC fans, I, I don't want you to mourn this too much because you're not getting the same experience, and you're not getting the same Ogeron, and you're not getting the same ride if this is at USC. Because I, like, you going back to something bigger here, you, this particular confluence of players, talent, context events this is so singular and it happens so fast i want you to remember dave aranda their defensive coordinator dave aranda redid the whole defense in like august yeah that explains a lot by the way 
right? Uh-huh. Because their defense took a while to get it going in a way that was bizarre to be LSU. And then by the end of the year, it's like, oh, so you guys are doing defense too. Okay, well, cancel Christmas. People go, oh, man, football is such a structured, organized thing. This is the team that, for me, most embodied a, a things just coming together. It's not that it was an accident. Oh, far from it. Very designed. Very intentional and a long time coming in a lot of different ways. But for everything to hit at once and for them to all hit peak performance, not at the end of the season, the regular season, I mean, they hit peak performance in the last game, right? In their last two games against Oklahoma and against Clemson. Yeah, this ain't happening again. And USC, you wouldn't have gotten this. You wouldn't have gotten Ed Ogeron bringing 20 pounds of crawfish like into a meeting. And decide, okay, well, we're eating. That's not happening in L.A. It's just not. I tell you this, though. Well, it might happen if he stayed there. Craziest thing going on, and I understand that people don't care this much about the granular stuff of college football, but all the good players in California leaving California. Yeah, no, this is my argument. I disagree with some of my, my coworkers, like Jason Kirk here, assessing, oh, hey, we need USC to be good so we can care about Pac-12 football. That's true. But if USC's not good, that talent doesn't even stay in the Pac-12. Oregon gets some of it. But if you look at the top 10 recruits who are coming out of California, they're going all over the place. There's like an Oklahoma. There's like a Georgia, Texas. You know, they leave. They will leave that state rather than play for second-ranked Pac-12 powers. It's not like the best recruits in L.A. say, well, I'll just go to UCLA. No, 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 no. That is a very different thing. You've yes. made a very different choice in life. <laughs> okay? That's like saying – Oh, I'll, I'll just get another beverage if they don't have Dr. Pepper. Texans, you hear me. There is no second beverage, right? Maybe a big red. That's not, no, it's not like that. You're just going to get water. You're going to go do something else. And you have to get in, right? Cause that's the thing yeah. about the thing about the four pack 12 schools in California. Two of them you got to get into. And one of them doesn't want to spend any money on anything. And then the other is USC. Yeah. Did we hear, did we hear anything about David Shaw being hired? As an NFL coach, this cycle around. No, what the, hell, check. What, what the hell is going on up there, by the way? Do you have an answer? No, no, I don't. <laughs> it's so small. And it's such a it's such an insular little community. And suddenly you've got people transferring out. You've got the performance on the field falling off. You've got their uh, recruiting tailing off. And you have the one thing that's been consistent and sustained from Sanford, uh, besides good offensive line play, which is rumors of David Shaw being favored as an NFL coach. You know, which I, I don't know. He runs an offense that likes to run the ball and go under center. So maybe and he, he doesn't really uh, say that much. So, uh, you know, a non-embarrassing safe NFL pick, I guess, is his profile. But, yeah, you haven't heard that. And Stanford is like Stanford in several different ways has fallen off badly. They lost their strength coach, which anybody will tell you that uh, losing a strength coach is losing a big part of the program. Especially at a school because, like that where you got to make your players. Mm-hmm. They don't come fully formed, right? You, you don't just roll them out there as freshmen. You got to go ahead and develop them, train them, uh, get them bigger, stronger, faster, and more flexible. And that's that's something that is a huge loss for a program. So I, I don't know what the deal is with Stanford. I know that talent won't go there unless it can get in, and uh, and I know that talent won't just go there because it's on the West Coast. Which is when you go like, okay, what are the Pac-12 problems? You go, well, some of them are structural. Um, a lot of them are problems by choice that they've they've made for themselves. Yeah, but with LSU and Ogeron and all this and Joe Burrow, who really played himself into the Cam Newton zone, which I did not think was possible. I still think Cam's 2010 is the best individual season just because he wasn't playing with any talent and LSU was loaded all the way around. But I can't think of anybody I've seen make a jump like Joe Burrow did because with Cam, we didn't see him play. I've seen Joe Burrow play before. This wasn't it. No, we've both seen Joe Burrow play, you know, mediocrely, right? We've both seen Joe Burrow play at a level which was nothing close to this. I don't mean just like a couple of, well, you know, he practiced and got better. No, looks like a different dude rolled out there, right? Looks like a completely different human being took the field with the same jersey on, right? I don't know. You you know, you say you think Cam had a better season. My comparison was this, that Cam was more of the single-handedly, I will blow everything up in a game if I have to, right? Running the ball, passing the ball, whatever. I don't think I've seen any, but, you know, it's not like Cam was – distributing the ball a lot it's not like you wanted to distribute the ball on that, <laughs> right. that, that Auburn team either right like I don't know if you want God rest his soul Phil Lutzenkirk and catching 15 balls right <laughs> that's not going to do that much for your offense at the same time uh, I, I don't think Cam had that shot right I don't think he had the chance that Joe Burrow had so it's a little unfair to you know compare both of them or to say that you know I think especially that that Joe Burrow had a better single season than Cam. I think Joe Burrow had a lot more tools around him. However, 
in that role, given what he had and given the privilege that he had to throw to a Jamar Chase. By the way, did you notice in that game, if anything went wrong and if they got behind schedule, uh, football's easy. Just throw it to Jamar Chase. <laughs> That's what they did. Like, this is not hard. Every time they began to develop something down the field and they take a loss or they get behind schedule, what do you do? I think I'm going to throw the ball to Jamar Chase because that was the dude who was working. This is something LSU did, by the way, at every opportunity this season, which was uh, one's not working. Well, I guess we'll just go to two a bunch of times. <laughs> that's that, that's it. You know, they did that with Jefferson. They did that with Marshall. They did that with Moss at times. They did that with Clyde, Clyde edwards Zillair in the Alabama game. Every time anything went wrong, they went back to him because nobody in the interior of Alabama's defense could handle him, either catching the ball or running the ball. They did what worked. They, they sat, you know, in that first quarter, there was a lot of, I don't know, can we get the ball to this guy? No? Okay. Okay. Jamar's open. That's a nice option to have. But but with all that, I don't think I've ever seen anybody in college football, period, serve as a better catalyst and, and conductor of an offense. Things just, what do you defend? Right. When Joe Burrow was there, he found out what was weak, and all of a sudden, everything's on fire. You can't you can't tackle everything that they're throwing at you. And the guy who was responsible for that more than anybody was Joe Burrow. Yeah, no, he did everything. I guess the way that I look at it is I watch what happened at Alabama when Tua went out and they brought in Mac Jones. And while Mac Jones was certainly not Tua, I think people underestimated the numbers that offense still put up with their like low you know, high tier three, low tier four star guy. Like he still came out there and did it. And I wonder what it would be if we had a quarterback other than Joe Burrow and dropped it in there. I know what would have happened at Auburn if that wasn't Cam Newton. And the answer, six and six. If you're lucky. Oh yeah. Like I think the the, the thing that nobody will disagree with on this point is this the highest value over replacement player yes. is the Cam Newton single handedly, right? I, I think that if you are going for an overall better season in terms of production it's real hard to argue yeah. it wasn't burrow 60 and you're... six <laughs> it's not sane <laughs> it's just not sane man it's not like i everybody listening to this right now is probably thinking oh yeah i realize he had a good season no you don't it's going to take you a couple of years to go back and look and go good lord this man did this in the sec yeah it was he like playing madden on pro oh yeah, playing Madden on pro, playing the old NCAA on Heisman, and and hitting 70% completion marks on passes, which, by the way, were not at the line of scrimmage. Typically, you see that, and you go, oh, that's Tim Couch with, with Kentucky, right? You, that's uh, some air raid guy throwing a 1,000 bubble screens. Nope, nope, Burrow on deep balls. Burrow on first down where they would throw for it. By the way, LSU, you remember football simple? We're going to go back to football simple. LSU passed the ball for seven yards on first down a lot. It's wild. They passed the ball like 65-35, I wanted to say. And when they ran it, they ran it with Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. That's a nice luxury to have when you go, hey, it's second and three every time we get the ball. I do feel like it could have been like this for a long time, though, because I've, uh-huh. I've said this a lot, and I don't think people really understand this point. Their problem at quarterback post-Jamarcus Russell was not that they weren't recruiting good quarterback prospects. They were. They were getting guys that other people wanted. Mm -hmm. They just didn't do anything with them once they got there, and that's with the head coach who fancied himself as an offensive guy. Yeah, and also, let's just give credit to Ed Ogeron for finally doing the obvious thing, which was going, uh, let's see, about an hour, hour and a half down the road in traffic to New Orleans and going, you know what? You guys have been scoring a ton of points in the NFL, where that's hard to do. Why don't we ask you what's up? The reason they did that, by the way, if you want to just chain all this together, they were going to face Joe Moorhead. That was the thing. They were going to face Joe Moorhead running a bunch of RPOs. And Ed Ogeron got in the room with Joe Brady and with his existing offensive coordinator, Steve Ensminger, and they listened to this guy talk. And they're like, oh, you know what? You, you seem real smart. Why don't you come coach with us? That's the kind of like leap that Ed Ogeron deserves all the credit in the world for taking here. That they didn't do it sooner, either under Ogeron or Miles, is insane. Because I want you to go back to like 2003. Was there a single player on offense who wasn't a running back? Like they're all running backs. They're all yeah. Because Josh Reed was gone by then, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Like if you want to just go in, like every single one of those players was just a fast twitch genius who, if you got the ball in space to them, would have done some damage. And, and and Les Miles slept on that for years, trying to run the same thing 
over and over and over again. His old athletic director, Joe Oliva, last week was like, yeah, I was like talking to a brick wall. Wasn't going to do anything different. And the minute they decide to change, look at that. Most most dynamic offense in the history of college football. And let me tell you something. Joe Oliva's got a better idea about football than you do. It's time to hang up that whistle. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm here to tell you that. It is time to hang up that whistle once that man makes that. Wow. Yeah, no. But I just... I, I watched all of this and the big thing with, I look at Ogeron, I'm now totally on the, if I'm hiring a head coach, I don't want a coordinator. I don't want that. Give me, give me your recruiting coordinator slash position coach. Give me that guy because that guy knows he ain't coordinating no damn whatever. And then he'll get people who can. Yeah, just get somebody, especially like, I think more than anything, if you look at the guys in this game who are coaching, you have Dabo Swinney and you have Ed Ogeron who are two people, if I said, uh, if I asked you, would they be successful somewhere else? The answer is yes. Would they be this successful? No. One particular part of this is that, you know, both guys want to be there, and both guys are very, very well suited to their particular niche here. That's Ed Ogeron is a Louisiana native, understands the entire state. He's going to get that on lockdown, but he's also a CEO. Dabo Swinney at Clemson, you know, when people say, well, you know, he's going to get hired away or Alabama might call for him, he's not valuable there's no place he is more valuable than he is at Clemson. There is no place where Ed Ogeron is more valuable than he is currently as head coach at LSU. And and I think that's an important distinction and why those guys uh, stay and will stay because you're not going to make the leap from a place where I'm worth $8 million a year to a place where I might get paid $8 million. But in reality, I'm probably, you know, like as replaceable as anyone else and at like five or $6 million. Dabble or dive a coronary if you coach at Alabama. And the reason is he listened too much. You can't do that job and listen as much as he does. No, 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 no. How, how are you going to, like, sell the disrespect card, which was Dabo's whole thing, right? Like, we're being disrespected. Defending national title. Yes. <laughs> Champions, right? Holders. Like, they, yeah, you, you're being disrespected because we're ranking you first? I do. I, okay. I, I, I actually agree with him. That was true. Then again, look what happened in the title game. That's true. Like, no, that is true also. Mm-hmm. But I do think this. Yeah. They, won, they won 29 straight games, and we didn't treat it like we did when Miami won 29 straight games or when USC did that. Like, I understand. We do still kind of look at them like, oh, Clemson is cute, but that's because of the presence of Alabama. Like, there's only room for one of those at a time, and Alabama gets the space. That's true. That's true. And, and additionally, too, I just think that, you know, people still have a hard time with Clemson because, one, have, haven't been on top as long. And, two, I, I think that, that people really don't know uh, where they are. <laughs> like, he's asking America to point out Clemson. Be like, that's somewhere. In I wonder South how Carolina? many people know what city Clemson is in. Yeah, it's a trick question, ain't it? <laughs> right. Like, I really wonder. Like, the answer is dead in your face, but I don't know how many people actually know. Like, if I were to go outside for today's show and ask Pablo, hey, man, where where is Clemson? I'm not positive that he would know because, to be honest, I'm not positive I knew <laughs> until I moved to North Carolina. Yeah, no, and, and, you know, could you find it on a map? That's even harder. I think if you went and asked Pablo, you'd put Harvard on his heels real fast because <laughs> it's, you know, Clemson is just, Clemson is just not as established a, a, you know, like Alabama culturally, like there are songs that mention Alabama football casually that are not written by sports fans. That's, you know, Deacon Blues mentions Alabama by name, right? Uh, for real unflattering reasons, but still, <laughs> like, it's a much larger brand and there's much more recognition. And at the same time, I, I feel like, you know, playing in the SEC is a slightly different deal than playing in the ACC, both historically and in the moment, right? Um, you're just going to get more pub, you know, the SEC network came first for a reason, right? There was more money to make and there were more eyeballs and there was a more established brand there. That's not insulting the ACC at all. If anybody wants me to insult the ACC, I got a real good case for doing that, but that's not what I'm doing right here. What I'm saying is Clemson won't get that same kind of respect, and Dabo's right in that respect, just because of where they are and, and who they are, not what they're doing or how they're playing, which was brilliant in winning 29 straight. What is the most famous moment in Clemson football history? Because I know I got my vote, and guess what? It ain't really about Clemson. No, I think if you asked any uh, football fan older than 30, that would that be the fumble ruski or would that be get, uh, against Florida State? Or if you're a little older, would it be giving up 70 to West Virginia in the Orange Bowl? <laughs> I was actually going for number three, which is Woody Hayes punching one of your players. Oh, yeah. Yeah, punching Charlie Bauman. Can you imagine Gator what Bowl. was going through his mind at that moment? I mean, rage. Because he punched him for real. Like, it wasn't, it, no. that wasn't, that wasn't just to say I did it. Woody Hayes tried to take him out. 
Oh yeah. What, what, Woody Hayes did, and this is coming by the way, like he destroyed a first down marker in the middle of the game. I believe the season before or a couple of seasons before. So like toward the end, it was whatever Ohio state's pressure was at the moment. It was, it was getting to him, but Clemson is, yeah, most famous for dethroning a guy who otherwise, you know, probably would have been one of the few coaches at Ohio State to retire on his own terms. Yes, still hasn't happened. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's like that and Auburn, man. Yo. <laughs> Two places where the end, you can you can hang on for a while, but the end, the end's going to be weird. Look, Earl Bruce was there for like 10 years. He had a really good year that first year. I think they finished like number two. Then after that, it was three losses a year, basically for a whole decade. John Cooper went two, 10 and one, I think it was against Michigan in his time there. Jim Trestle won a national championship. Urban Meyer won a national championship. They all left the same way. No, they're kind of like some sort of doomed uh, kingdom. Right. Like that's every time, every time somebody gets that crown, they'll be up there for a while. They're going to win a few. And then, then the end is going to start to get bizarre on you. So just, just expect that. Right. I think if you're an Ohio state coach, you've been there eight years, resign. Yeah. Just resign. If you've won one or two and you go, Oh man, this is real nice. I think I'm going to take a couple of years off boys. Cause you know, what's coming down the road. Nothing good. <laughs> I tell you another reason, though, I think that Clemson doesn't get that respect that Dabo wants. And it's interesting because Clemson is low key the new Miami, right? Like, mm-hmm. like that's, I think that's the last time you can make the argument for Florida also, but I feel like this, like, Miami probably fits a little better. The last time that you just had a power build in the way that this power built and in a place where you're really not supposed to do that. Cause it's more logical that Florida could build what Florida built in the nineties than it is that Miami, you know, a couple, you know, the talent, the, the local talent thing comes up, but it was still like more of a shocking sort of thing that this place would be the one that could find a way to get it done. What's wild about Clemson to me, though, Miami, we always knew the names of those guys. It's kind of crazy that we don't really know Clemson dudes' names like that. That's wild. The other wild thing is this, that they've managed to do that with five stars. Yes. that's If you look at recruiting, it's not like they're a bunch of no names. It's that they're managed and handled in a way where the team brand is the thing that comes first and the kind of five stars that they recruit, which by the way, they do selectively. It's not just like they're picking four and five star recruits because they're on the list. It's because they're picking the ones that they want and leaving the rest. (laughs) Think about the recruiting prowess there. Think about the kind of luxury, that level that Clemson's operating at where they go, no, we just want these guys. That's it. We could have more. Do you like that left tackle? We don't like him as much. Oh, he's a five-star. This is basically, Clemson gets to do this right now, okay? The only other team that comes close is maybe Alabama. They walk into the showroom and they're like, Maserati, that's quaint. We'll take two more Ferraris, please. <laughs> they just pass it over. It's another, like, like bunch of supercars all lined up. And they just go, yeah, we'll take that $600,000 one and not that $600,000 one. And, yo, no disrespect. They facilities got to be the best thing in the world, right? Because I ain't going there. That's the other thing. You talk about Miami and Florida being powers. Florida to a lesser extent, because I'm just going to put it this way. Main Street and Gainesville, uh, not exactly <laughs> South Beach, <laughs> not exactly even Coral Gables. And I went there for four years. <laughs> but I will say this. It's South Beach compared to downtown Clemson. And there's there's nothing there's there's nothing there there's clemson university lovely community beautiful little burg up in upstate south (laughs) carolina but you're not going there because you like the cosmopolitan atmosphere of a bustling major city that ain't the deal this isn't usc in the 2000s where part of the cell was hey you know you're a top prospect from virginia do you want to play in horrible humidity in the acc or would you like to come out to la where you're basically a movie star. And you ain't in, never in, seen nothing like that before when you get off the plane. Nothing. You've never felt it. You get off the plane and you're like, it's 70 degrees and I don't want to die. <laughs> it's amazing. Everything's super pleasant. And then all of a sudden, oh, you also get to play for USC. We're the NFL team in town. And always have been and always will be. That's that. This is not what Clemson gets to pitch. What they get to pitch is, why don't you come play for Clemson? and compete for national titles and get drafted in the NFL because by the way we can put if you're a defensive lineman we could put four of you in the draft at once yeah easy three in the first round mhm 
Three three in the first round. Oh, and after you won a national title and you beat up on who? Oh, yeah, that's right, the existing belt holder, Alabama. So you beat The Undertaker, and then you get a first-round pick. How's that for a recruiting pitch? It's pretty good. Explains a lot. I like everything about Clemson except the coach. I told you that the other day. And I used to kind of <laughs> like him. I there There's a lot to like about, like, I, I love the way they play offense. They're aggressive. They put people in a space to succeed. They trust individual players, and they play him as freshmen. Like, remember Justin Ross against Alabama? He's ruining that secondary as a kid who was playing high school the year before. This is one thing they won't get enough credit for. They came out in a 3-1 set against that LSU offense. A three with bonkers. It, Joe Burrow had no idea what he was looking at for the first quarter. None. And then it didn't matter because he figured out, just get the ball to Jamar Chase. <laughs> No defense can solve this. But uh, they dared them to run, and LSU did not run on them. LSU decided, nope, doubling down, just sticking to this whole passing thing that's been working well. <laughs> and 600 yards and 40-plus points later, there we are. What they do defensively is awesome. Brett Venables did a great job. I just don't think there is. It, Tony Romo made the best comment I have heard in football commentary in years when Jim Nance asked him what the Texans should do about the – Chiefs offense, which was ripping them up at this point in the game. And Jim Nance says, well, what, what do you do with this? And Romo said, well, Jim, if they had answers, they would have used them by now. <laughs> and that's... It, it, it's the, it was the best encapsulas, encapsulation of I, I've, I've got great answers. It's just that the problems are way bigger <laughs> than those answers, right? I, You know, like Sometimes you see a team do that, and you think a coach could just say, well, move this guy here. Guess what? That guy doesn't matter when the other guy's Jamar Chase. It just doesn't. Dude, that game, once uh, Kansas City has scored the second touchdown, it was like, oh, okay. Done. I know, I know what's going to happen now. <laughs> it was done. Man, it was done, when, it was done on that fourth and one. It was done. Over. Next, like, Chiefs rolled out, and they're like, this next play is going for 60. They knew it. <laughs> They knew it. Same thing with LSU. This is the kind of thing you can do when you are playing at full capacity of talent and execution. When they came out and they scored, and all of it, Clemson, by the way, doesn't just come back like you know they they go uh, they go down, then they come back up at seventeen seven at one point, and at seventeen seven, LSU special teams are out there like fanning the ball and dancing because they know that offense is coming. They know, and by the way, defensively. LSU made Clemson punt nine That's times. bananas. Trevor Lawrence, dude, Trevor Lawrence was like, I've never had to do anything this hard before in my life on a football field. Nope. Like, I imagine he played varsity as a freshman in high school, and he still ain't never had to do anything as difficult as that. No, and, and by the way, they got after Etienne. Etienne is like an astonishing running back. A brilliant talent. Just a, a player who in five yards can go from sitting still to 20 miles an hour. Nuts. The acceleration on the Travis Etienne model is just otherworldly. And they had four dudes on him the whole time. My favorite sequence in the whole game, I believe it's in the end of the first quarter, he dodges three tacklers, three, and then turns, and there's a defensive tackle who falls on him. It's just not fair, right? Like, he did everything you're supposed to do. I made three elite defenders miss me, and the fourth is a 300-pound man who fell on me. All right, we'll be back with more with Spencer Hall. But first, it's a new year. Perfect opportunity to take your business to the next level by hiring the right people. But finding qualified candidates can be challenging. ZipRecruiter.com slash Bomani makes it easy. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invite them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Bomani. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash B-O-M-A-N-I. ZipRecruiter.com slash Bomani. ZipRecruiter, smartest way to hire. It's a good chance Odell Beckham gave him some bread. Yo, what was he doing? Odell was having a wonderful time. Yeah! I don't know why everybody... 
I don't know why everybody's getting on somebody who's clearly <laughs> just celebrating <laughs> and having a, a marvelous time and wanting to share the wealth a little bit. Yeah. Also, if you're upset about college athletes receiving a couple hundred bucks from from one of their their mentors on the field in front of everybody, go look at the payrolls. <laughs> just, you can't. Just going, oh, man, how dare they receive money? What? Dabo got like $600,000 in bonuses so it can build a second La Quinta <laughs> in Clemson? This house kind of looks like a La Quinta, man. It really does. Oh, God, it I was hoping like... that he owned a La Quinta. Oh, that no, would have been does, so big. great. He does, basically. His house is kind of castle looking. It kind of looks like a steak and ale meets a La Quinta. <laughs> if you remember steak and Yo, ale. Yo, steak and yeah. ale still in the league? There's a steak and ale in downtown Atlanta, but I don't know if that means they're still in the league. That might be a rogue steak and ale for all I know. Yo, I, I had forgotten about the steak and ale in Atlanta. I had forgotten about steak and ale. Wow. This is, this is, this is a thing. Like, you know, of course, I obviously don't care about these dudes getting a little bread. Although I would have looked at Odell and been like, bruh, I ain't even got no pockets. <laughs> like, what, like, what am I supposed no. to do with this money? Where am I gonna, where am I gonna keep all this? By the way, also, they, they were smoking cigars in the locker room afterwards. Yes. And did you follow this entire song? Yeah, with the cop who actually told him to stop. Shouts out to the cop who walks in and has such faith in the August power of the law <laughs> that he thinks his mere presence can compel a recently victorious football team on an all time testosterone high. Like 50 dudes who all outweigh you. And who just finished four hours of punching and getting punched in the face? You walk in and you're like, put those cigars out. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck, man. Good luck. I, I understand, by the way, from one report that Odell Beckham had some words for that policeman because he, like me, understood the math better than the cop. Do you know what they then did with those cigars? They put them out and threw them in a plastic trash can. So good. Great solution, guys. <laughs> Awesome management on their part there. True story. That cop would have had a better chance if he had roughed Odell Beckham up in the locker room than he would have trying to stop these guys from smoking. Oh, that would have gone way better than trying to tell these guys to stop smoking. Than trying to stop Joe Burrow? Of you know, all Joe people. Joe Burrow was, he was a, it like effectively just had extra legal powers that night. <laughs> that was the governor of Louisiana. If Joe Burrow had decided that there was no school the next day, there wouldn't have been school the next day. He could have just done that, right? You're going to try to keep him from smoking a cigar? Good luck. Well, also, speaking of the governor of Louisiana, you know who his buddy is? Yeah, Ed Ogeron. Ed Ogeron. <laughs> right. Like, I imagine that he was there when that happened. Because there's some real, there's some real weird politics stuff that's going on around this. Like, Trump used this as a way to get himself to FaceTime with his people. But the Democratic governor of Louisiana has also been doing the exact same thing with Ed Ogeron. Like, there's a lot that's going on there. And I say all that to say, you're going to tell the governor to quit smoking because that's basically what you was trying to do. That's what you're trying to do. Also, the John Bell Edwards thing and, and being bros with Ogeron is a neat way to go ahead and highlight this, that the three highlight videos and the entire season full of, you know, myth building surrounding the LSU team, it's essentially one long Ed Ogeron greatest hits mixtape. That's all this is, because remember, they, they got The Rock to do their final highlight Oh, it's Miami guy. Uh-huh. That wasn't out. They're like, how much did they pay him? Ed Ogeron didn't have to. Because he can call The Rock and get a favor. You know why? Because he coached Dwayne The Rock Johnson at Miami when he lost his job to Warren Sapp. Yep. That's how far back and how deep Ed goes there, right? If Ed Ogeron wants something in that particular environment, he calls them and he gets it done, right? Does he need a favor? He can call the governor. I'm going back to this point. There are coaches, and then there are coaches who fit in a niche so well that they kind of transcend that. And Ed is real close to that right now. In a way that, by the way, Nick Saban in Alabama is not. No. I'm going to say this. Nick Saban's replaceable. Yeah. All right? Dabo and Ed, they're not. That's a great right? point. Because they're not. Ed, you know what? Nick is part of a machine. And if that machine needs a new part, guess what? They can replace that part. It might take a couple of suppliers. It might take a couple of tries but they can replace that part and win a national title, right? Ed and Dabo, the way they built this up, they're able to go back to their bosses and say, you know what? This this happened because of me and because of who I am, not what I am, which is a good football coach, right? Like Nick Saban could go, I am the greatest football coach 
of our time. They go, yeah, that's, you know, that's undoubtedly true. Can I go ahead and go back to this point? Are you the greatest coach at this place though? Right. Right. At this moment. And that's the part that that's where Ed wins. That's where Ogeron and that's where Dabo Swinney. And I'm trying to think of anyone else who has that particular fit at the moment. That's where Bobby Bowden in Florida state won, right? Like, yeah. Y'all, I'm I am the organ, right? right? I'm we're, the thing that makes this work. Where Miami was, no, we have a machine, and honestly, we don't care if this whole thing falls apart. We don't like these guys. Um, part of what I think is also fascinating with uh the idea of Saban is they had once believed Bear Bryant to be this larger than life legend, and also believed that every coach they have after should be able to do the exact same thing. It doesn't make any mm-hmm. sense, but that's what has powered their whole thing for decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the, this is the thing. Dan Mullen said that it's way easier to go from four and eight to 10 wins than it is to go from 10 to 11. And that's because the pressure at the top and the competition is so very, very intense. And that's where Alabama's at because they're usually cruising at 10, right? You want to know why they're crazy? They're trying to get to 11 wins. They're trying to get to 12. And that distance, that last little gap in getting those two games against top competition, those are the hardest steps to take. Those are the hardest holds to reach. That is the last margin and the most difficult part to do. So when Alabama says, you know, hey, we should do this every single time, it's because, you know, given the commitment that they have organizationally, nine or ten wins, that's going to be nice. It's going to be fine. They'll tell you that, right? When somebody tells you something's fine, Alabama will be like, yeah, you know, nine wins is fine. Yeah. <laughs> that, they, don't, they don't mean it. Yeah, Alabama, it, you know? Alabama's like, what'd you think I grind for to drive a f- RAV4? No! <laughs> right? Like, that's not, that's, that's not the, I, I don't do all this working to be driving your regular old four-door sedan. No! No! We are just you, you, done. You know, this is cute. I'm happy with a steak, if you call this a steak. <laughs> it's not what I would call a steak now, is it? <laughs> Now, let me, let me ask you this. Are you familiar with a gentleman named Edwin Edwards? Oh, yes. The, I, I believe four-time governor of Louisiana. Yes, the only thing that would make this LSU thing better is if Edwin Edwards was the governor. Can you imagine how Edward Edwards would be skinned and gritted with Ed Ogeron? And for those of you who don't know, yes, it's not simply that Edwin Edwards was the governor like four times or something like that. It's that he is the most everybody-knows-he's-running-game politician ever that people love. If Edwin Edwards ran tomorrow, I can tell you a whole bunch of people, and a lot of them are black, that would be in the street right then to go vote for Edwin Edwards. Edwin Edwards also by the way is the originator of the all-time quote about politics the only way i could lose is if they caught me with a dead girl or a live boy that's his quote he yeah, been right edward, along it do you want to know how much game edwin edwards has this is how much he authorized the uh entry of police into the campus at southern university all right in the 60s during student protests that was edmund edwards gave it the green light it's totally fine. You know whose face is like front and center at the uh, Southern University School of Law? Big old portrait. Everybody loves him. Big glowing paragraph written about him and his support for Southern University. That's right, Edwin Edwards. That's that's how much game Edwin Edwards has. Look, my dad, you have to remember, was ejected from Southern University uh, for mm-hmm. protesting in the 1960s. And I don't recall him saying a bad thing about Edwin Edwards. Nope. <laughs> just, just, just like Edwin. And, and by the way, my dad is from a little town called Oakdale, Louisiana. And Edwin lived in Oakdale, uh, during the first decade of this millennium. Ask me why. <laughs> why? That's where the pen is. <laughs> he was, he, he was in the Oakdale Correctional Facility while he was doing that time. Why was Edwin Edwards doing that time, you ask? Because Edwin Edwards shook down Eddie DeBartolo, owner of the 49ers, behind a casino simply because he had felt that Eddie DeBartolo, that's Eddie DeBartolo Jr., had not shown him proper deference. So he demanded a payment. Not because he wanted the money, not because he needed the money, but because he was Edwin Edwards. Also, by the way, he did all this, I believe, in his 70s. I think in, in the last 15 years, since Edwin Edwards turned uh, 70 or, or plus, he's uh, been to jail. Yes. Like big bad jail, serious jail. And also, I believe, got married and had a kid again. Oh, yeah, yeah, and no, I no. Just, he's got a kid much younger than me. Yeah. Let me go ahead and posit this. That's too much. <laughs> too much, Edwin. 
<laughs> it's too much even for you, man. That's, you know what should happen after you turn like eighty? Nothing. Should be nothing. Your list of th- like your next accomplishment should be death. That's it. We need him with Ed Ogeron. That is what we need. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. We need him with Ed Ogeron. Because this whole Ogeron thing is so Louisiana. And did you read uh, Ross Dellinger's thing in Sports Illustrated, the long thing he did on Ogeron? Yeah. But I thought it was interesting. You know, he went to Cajun country, and I think that's good because a lot of people don't know much about the life that they're living down there. And Ed Ogeron is theirs, man. He is 100% theirs. They love that dude to death. But I did think it was funny when Cajun Cats had a quote. was like, why are we allowed to make fun of the way that he speaks? And the guy said, I'm going to get the order wrong. But he said, you can't do that with Mexicans, Africans, Asians. And I'm like, first of all, they do. The Asians would definitely disagree with you about that, about whether people mm-hmm. are allowed to make fun of how they talk. And number two, we are not making fun of Ed Ogeron's accent. It's the gravel. Like, We're I, making fun of the fact that he sounds like a talking rock tumbler. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and, it, and it hits you immediately. Like, his vocals slap the tape so hard from the first bar. It's like, oh, man, oh, that's right, it's Ed. Got it. People who have not been in the same room with him or done a press conference or anything, they don't realize that once you hear it, you won't stop doing it. It's yeah. not like you go, oh, well, I've been making fun of his accent. No, you make fun of the fact that um, Ed speaks at a volume and at a tenor that you can hear from the next room, and you know it's Ed. It's like a car pulling up in your driveway. And now he's yeah, legend. It's, yeah, no, he's he's legend before. Now he's something else, man. He's like, like for the next six months till they play again, he gets to be a Louisiana demigod. And now we have to look at a happy nine and three next year. Yo. Because guess what happened the minute everyone won? Boom! Deuces were thrown. Yeah, later. <laughs> later. Yo, because let, let's, let's not forget this about LSU. Because that Alabama LSU game has been so big every year in SEC, and honestly, people talk more about this stuff than they watch it in, like, on the national sense. Like, not people who are just really, like, into the nuts and bolts like me and you about it. Most people are just coming in. Yo, man, this has basically been a three or four, sometimes five loss program for about 11 years coming into this one. They lost four yeah. games last year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and and lost them against people who uh, this year they just turned around and beat by uh, double scores. Remember, Florida played them. Florida played them close, yeah. and uh, then in a the quarter they just uncorked uh, you know a 14 point gap because they could do that. And uh, when they changed everything up, by the way, uh, that 2023 win over Auburn, which surely would have been a case of where Auburn does that thing of where they do absolutely nothing but obstruct you the whole game and then miraculously <laughs> pull two or three plays from their hind quarters to win guess what um that ended up being a comfortable win where joe burrow i don't know if i think he only threw for 330 yards <laughs> in that game and and one td that that's about what you were limiting him to that's when i knew that everybody in the playoff was in trouble because you go well what did auburn do to them when they were trying to auburn in their hardest you go <laughs> oh he still had he still had 300 plus in a td didn't make any big mistakes like yeah y'all are dead Everyone who faces them are dead already. Hey, looking back on it, the least impressive thing of the LSU season is the fact they gave up 20 points to Arkansas. Keep it in mind, they gave up 20 points to Arkansas the week after Arkansas scored 19 against Western Kentucky. <laughs> That's When you go, man, what's our improvement metric this season for LSU's defense? You go, well, we went from being one point worse than Western Kentucky's defense to making Clemson punt nine times. Dave Aranda, <laughs> good job, man. Good job. Yeah. Do you think Dave Aranda gets a little salty here at all this Joe Brady talk? Do you think he gets a little salty? Now, granted, he's the highest paid assistant coach in America, right? But do you think he's kind of like, how come anybody talking about hiring me? No, this is that Alonzo Morning gif, right? Where, you know, <laughs> shaking your head on the bench like, nobody's talking about me. Then you check your bank account and you go, well, you know, there's that. <laughs> there's that, y'all. Yeah, got a point. Got a point. And thank you, by the way, in helping me that day when I was trying to find out if Dave Aranda was black. Uh, you're welcome. I did my I did my best to provide you with documented sources. It was no, no hearsay from me, dude. It was so tough. Nobody really knew. Nobody had a great answer. Nobody did. Right? Everybody was just like, "Huh? Good question." Right? And you know what that tells me? The underrepresentation of our Latino brothers in college football. Because basically, if I see you and you're Latin and you're like a coach, but I don't know yeah. anything about you, but that my guess is going to be black or Polynesian. I learned that in yeah. this quest. There's uh there's also this that that if you're looking at that lack of representation, you should uh follow for example our, our own Alex Kirshner this morning who said that if you're looking at a coach and he's a retread like Bobby Petrino, who's uh you know, just a guy who 
I don't, you can go look up his resume. It's fascinating. <laughs> you, might, you might have a giggle or two. You should go look up what he's done. Um, if you're thinking about hiring one of those guys, there's an easy solution that not only helps diversity, but also sort of increases the overall quality of the game in terms of new ideas and representation. And, and you know what that idea is? You can always hire another coach. You could just, there are other coaches to hire. They're out there. Just go to AFCA. They're all over the place, man. <laughs> you know, hell, guess what? Maybe you hired the defensive line coach that everybody just thought was a joke and you win a national title. Or I don't know, maybe you hire the wide receivers coach who was selling real estate before he got back into coaching who ends up winning a couple of national titles at Clemson. You can always hire another coach. <laughs> How bad do you want to win at Missouri State to decide that you're going to do this? And how bad do you want a coach to go take the job if you're already rich? It's the darkest timeline, right? When you go, well, um, I guess this means I have to admit that Bobby Petrino really likes coaching. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a... This can't be about the greed, y'all. <laughs> Where is Missouri State? Is it Springfield? Good, it's not. I think it's in the south. I think it's in like the southeast corner. Okay. Of, yeah. Like I, I don't exactly know where, but I know somebody was like, oh, yeah, I was close to here. And I'm saying this from Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> so I'm guessing it's like southeast corner. Yeah. A- anyway. Yeah. You, you gotta, you gotta just want to do the job at that point. Cause, uh, it's, it's not about glamour or money. Uh, so Jeff Long works at Kansas now, right? Let's say two years, this, what's Stan's last name? Stan, 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 Stan. Pittman, is that his name? The dude, the dude, Arkansas just Sam, hired? Oh, Sam, Sam, yeah, Sam Pittman. There we go. Sam, my bad. Let's say this doesn't work after two years. Let's say Bobby goes 10 and 2, 10 and 2 at Missouri State. I guess they said oh, they got a law in place that would stop it. Arkansas. Yeah, yeah, they said they had a law in place to stop that from happening, but I know enough about the South, baby. Ain't no, like, ain't no law, really no law if you don't want it to be. Bobby, come back. I mean, look what's happened since he left. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, that's that's the thing is that if, if things go according to plan, Bobby Petrino messes this whole golden arc up. That's it. <laughs> and he gets caught for something else. In Missouri or but you might go to the there. Sugar Bowl before it, you do. You might. You might. I, I think. You, how's this? All can be forgiven. Yes. Because, you know. The Lord puts forgiveness in our hearts for a reason. We want to do it. We want to welcome people back. And you know what? Bobby might have done some bad things. Why don't you list those bad things? They're hilarious. <laughs> it's a long list of really funny things, y'all. <laughs> but the thing is, his bad things are mostly just being sleazy, right? Like, yeah. the bad thing with the motorcycle, it was certainly a violation of the law, but I don't think it, like, offended most people's sensibilities, right? Uh, the right. run of the snake move on Tuberville, nobody really cared about that. The way he dipped out on the Falcons, wow, it really is a long list. Um, all those, yeah, 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 damn, yeah, nah, nah, you can't really do this. But I tell you, think about, we have not talked enough about what the lineage of Arkansas coaches has been, right? I can't remember who had the job before Houston Nutt. Whoever was between, oh, Danny Ford, I think, had the job Ford. before Houston Danny Nutt. Ford. So we go from Danny Ford to Houston Nutt and all the things that come with Houston Nutt, including bizarre foyer requests. Mm-hmm. Then we go from him to Bobby Petrino. Mm-hmm. Then we go from him for a year with John L. Smith. Or as no, Holly no. told me, John eight. L. Smith, the L is not a W. Eight, eight months. Yes. Eight, who, eight months. Who, not by the not way, a year. An eight-month contract. Who, by the way, was broke as the Ten Commandments and going in the media room, taking food and putting it in Tupperware boxes because he literally didn't have the money. Oh, lost it all in a real estate scam in Kentucky. Yeah. Ha- yeah. Happened to a lot of coaches, by the way. Mm-hmm. Well, y'all talk about the players, but okay. Anyway, so we go from him to Brett Bielema, the best slash worst fit ever of a guy in school. It looked like a great oh. fit. It was not. Yeah, you know who you know who Bielema's offensive line coach was, Sam Pittman. Yep, that's right, that's right, that's right. Because they went from that to Chad Morris, which seemed like the best idea they'd had in quite a while, and now they got so far to the bottom of the barrel because they greatly misunderstood how attractive their job would be. Because you know what happens at places like Arkansas? Here's what happens, right? Mm-hmm. And actually, Fayetteville, Arkansas, not a terrible place, but not necessarily the first place that you want to go. And so when those places come, and somebody like me says that, they're like. 
things have gotten a lot better here, you know, since the last time you were there. Guess what? That's the same as everywhere else in America. Everybody else is getting better, too. And they thought they could get somebody to finish at best fourth in the SEC West. And they Yeah, did. like, hey, man, look, look, we got a Starbucks now. Well, yeah, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I went to the town that I went to high school in, you know, where I mm-hmm. went to school growing up. And, I mean, I, I'm there so rarely, so it's always seismic changes when I get back. Town called Walla, Texas. Population when I was there was like 1,493 people. The school's got a lot more students now than it did when I was there. But it's still, I mean, it's a small town. Yeah. And I'll go back, and I didn't really think about it when I was there, but I'm like simultaneously struck by how little is there based on what my younger mind thought, but also how much more is there than the last time I was there. So you want to talk about the Alonzo morning, Jeff? That's me driving through that town and then seeing the Popeyes. <laughs> well, right. I'm like, huh, got a Popeyes. That's right. With the eight before the homecoming game at reunion. This is like, whoa, whoa. Th- this is what's up. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Like I'm, I'm in Nashville. I used, you know, I grew up uh, around here, uh, just in a town south of here, but spent plenty of time in Nashville. And you know, didn't. It's not exactly my kind of place. And uh, but at the same time, you're, you're going. Well, you know, I can't get a decent latte now yeah. here, can't I? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Mm. The Popeyes, as I recall, was not far away from the Sonic, and it always been a Sonic, but it was like the encapsulation of, wow, new stuff, the Popeyes, and then the sign on the Sonic said, Frito Pie is back, and I'm like, when did it ever leave? (laughs) If I know anything about Texas, the Frito Pie ain't never left. What dark, sad force removed the Frito Pie from our lives? And what saint brought it back? Yo, I remember, because we moved there when I was seven. Like, right before I turned seven, we moved there. And I used to pack a lunch, but everybody ate lunch at school, and so I wanted to be like the other kids. And so I started voluntarily eating school lunch, which, in retrospect, not the greatest decision I ever made, but that's socialization, right? Like, that's the gag. On Friday one day, early, they said we were having Frito Pie, like the announcements, you know, where they announced what lunch was and they announced yeah. that it was Frito Pie and the happiness that filled up the room. And I had <laughs> no idea what a Frito Pie was. They were so ready for that Frito Pie. Like, y'all, I mean, if, if you ain't heard anybody talk about the Frito Pie, I don't know if this is like this in like city parts. Cause the more I think about it, nobody in Houston's really talking about the Frito Pie. But I'm telling you, at Walla, uh, Holloman Elementary School, and every, the Frito Pie was the jail. I will count it with this. You say no one in Houston's talking about Frito Pie, but if you eat a cream burger right next to the stadium of, of U of H, if you eat a cream burger, you can get a hamburger, you can get a shake, you can get an order of fries, and as a side, you can get Frito Pie. Okay. Not as the main. They'll give you a Frito Pie as a side. That's, the That's least... why Texas is the great – it's why it's the greatest state in, like, like the union. Well, it's not a, you know, we're not really a state. It's true. That's why it's the greatest country in North America. There you go. It's Texas. That's what we need. That 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 that's what we need, right? That's it. That's that's it. We're gonna put Chad L. Butler on some coins. I think Bill Simmons once said. <laughs> Bill Simmons once said. He said the only reason that Canada is a different country from the United States and Texas isn't is because Canada prints its own money. No, we need some. We need some Pimp C coin. Yeah, we got to make this happen. We got to. Man, this is this has been fun. I'm trying to think if we missed anything. I'm still amazed, by the way, at how dumb Odell Beckham was. Eldo wants somebody to look at him so bad. <laughs> and can we talk about snitching Joe Burrow? He's like, well, I'm not a student athlete anymore, so I can say, yeah, the money is real. Well, some of them cats are still student athletes, Joey. <laughs> that, was Joe's, that was Joe's only fumble on the night, man. Yeah, that, come on, that, man. That I do enjoy Joe finally just, like, dropping the cape and being like, yeah. I'm not a student athlete. I'm a I'm a football player, y'all. <laughs> if you need me, I'm going to be in my limousine over here. <laughs> like yeah. immediately going Hollywood with it while his his friends have immediately dropped to outside. Like there's a moment there where you go from like Joe just put you outside the club, right? Like the velvet <laughs> rope came down at that moment, right? Like, well, yeah, I'm not a student athlete anymore. I'll see you guys. Deuces. The cigar's great. <laughs> I do like, though, that Joe won the Heisman and Joe put off poor white people. And I mean that sincerely, because I do feel like as weird as this may seem, in a lot of ways, that is a really an overlooked group. And they very rarely oh, yeah. look up to athletic competition and see themselves because most of the white dudes that like, at least anecdotally, at least from what I could observe, you can tell me if I'm wrong. But it does seem like the white dudes who excel athletically in this country and the sports that we watch come from money. Right. Like access is what gets them in there. Skill, skill players in particular, I think you can probably like delve into your offensive line. Yeah, yeah, I don't know that much about the Midwest. You're, you're, and your goons and you can get into like some, 
some guys who are probably from some less privileged backgrounds. But, you know, if quarterback is the new violin and it requires yeah. lessons, instruction, and investment, yeah, you're seeing more mm-hmm. Andrew Lux, right? And way fewer Joe Burrows. Joe Burrow, by the way, like in displaying real emotion and like what appeared to be sincere humility and awe of his situation, he might be the only people who realize exactly what kind of a season Joe Burrow was having. Yes. Like he, he might be, he might be the person most attuned to the magnitude and the uniqueness of this season because I, I, I haven't seen a player sort of really be able to take that in. And, and be awed by it, but also realize what he was doing was so singularly impressive and unique. I, I haven't seen many guys who can do that. And I think he was the only one who really sort of, you know, realizes what I think everyone else is going to realize a year or two now, which was, you know, this this caught fire and there really won't be too many things like it. Yeah, like he needs to hit over my favorite uh, line from the Allen Iverson practice press conference. Actually, my second favorite line. My favorite line is, how the hell am I supposed to help my teammates get better by practicing? Which is far deeper <laughs> than anybody realizes. <laughs> like, as my man Rod, black guy who tips says, he was rejecting the notion of practice. Not simply the idea of him going. He didn't understand what the, like, why are we even doing this? It made no sense to him. But the other line was, at some point, somebody, one of the reporters was laughing because obviously this whole thing had gone bizarre. And he goes, I know. It's funny to me, too. And that's how I feel Joe Burrow feels about all of this. I know. It's crazy, man. <laughs> This is nuts. Yeah. I have no idea. I didn't see this coming. I didn't see this coming, but he put off on them folks that was hungry. And I'm like, yo, good looking out. And now I want to hear more of the stories of them offensive line types. You know what I mean? Because, like, you watch the draft. The draft is poverty poor now every year. Every kid whose dad died or whatever it was, or whoever's mama was single or anything else, they're going to tell you that whole story. Now, I want to hear about them small town Wisconsin goons. Tell me about the life. Tell me about the people from your town. Because whenever I talk to white people from the little towns where, the, where, where stuff be happening there, all their stories are the best i got a buddy with a story about a time one of them dudes tried to burn the whole town down oh no he tried to burn a little bit of the town down and burn a little too much oh is that is that from wisconsin is that from someplace no that's northern Hawaii? california which is a world that people forget about not and i don't mean oh, the bay you know, i mean the north no no you get a lot of like places where it's super cold and every now and then somebody's just like you know what make me warm burning down a couple of houses yes i'm a little crazy i've been inside too long i think i'm gonna burn down a couple of houses Northern California, I just assume that person's crazy. If they do that in like Minnesota or Wisconsin, I'm like, well, maybe Olaf had a bad week. <laughs> Where do you go with like Appalachia? Yeah, with Appalachia, it's usually this. It's usually somebody when you go, well, yeah, we're going to go to the grocery store. And they're like, well, why would you do that? I got a deer in the fridge, <laughs> right? I got, I got like, I got some pickles. Well, this is what we're going to do, y'all. This is my, my brother ran a construction crew. And uh, on site in West Virginia for a while. And when it was buck week, he came to work and his crew was gone. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. He's like, we got pickles over here and the yap on the wall. <laughs> we could get mm-hmm. some food. Yeah. No, they, they were gone for a week. And when they came back, they didn't explain it. <laughs> they didn't say, oh, we were deer hunting. They came back like, you know. <laughs> and one guy, one guy didn't. And they didn't explain that either until two days later. My brother said, well, what are you doing? Where's this guy? Like, where's Carl? And they're like, oh, it's it's bear season. I'm like, well, where'd he go? And they're like, well, when we broke camp, he just walked deeper into the woods. We'll see him in a week or two. <laughs> Different world, man. Carl, Carl, Carl just kept walking, man. <laughs> gotta go, gotta go get a bear. Yeah, see, I don't have much Appalachia experience, but I imagine that Appalachia is much like I feel about like the Mississippi Delta. Everybody needs to go because I don't think you understand just how much America there is. And there's an America here that you need to check out because this is really how people out here living. I think Appalachia is like the other side of that coin. Listen, if you're not in for the whole experience, why don't you just get yourself up to Gatlinburg? Why don't you, that's it. Why don't you just go? Why don't you just go to big, beautiful Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg? Go do a tour at Dollywood. Remember Dollywood. The only theme park where you can bring your dog. Did not know that. Yeah, yeah, that it's it's like that. It's like that. If you just want a little taste of it without walking out in the woods with Carl and hunting a bear, go go, go up there and see what vacation in the Appalachians looks like. Did I tell you about the moment my daddy said he was like, you know, my dad's from a little town in Louisiana, so he seen some things. But the moment he fully realized that the Delta was a different place because he worked uh, for a couple of years at Mississippi Valley State running an institute, mm-hmm. and he picked up some uh, some pork rinds off the shelf 
And, you know, my dad, actually, my dad turned 83 this week. So this is about 15 years ago, right? So, you know, late 60s, brings the pork rinds and he puts them down on the cabinet. And the man look at him and say, they going to be hard on your false teeth. <laughs> my dad's teeth are not false. <laughs> but that guy could not conceive of the idea that a man this age could have his own teeth. Because the Delta is a different place. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> it could, it, it, it look, understand, my dad wasn't walking in there with like a mouth of them Jerry Jones teeth. You know what I'm saying? He got teeth of a man who was born in the 30s of Louisiana. So it's not like they the greatest teeth in the world. This man could not believe that he had any teeth unless they were fake. You know, if if. If you've been there, you know. And if you don't, I suggest a vacation. Just a <laughs> tour. Just a couple of days, man. Just a good pass through. You know, you got to get off the interstate, right? You got to you gotta mm-hmm. get off the interstate mm-hmm. to do that. But you got to uh, – Jay A told the story was – I don't know where exactly Alcorn is. I don't think it's in the Delta, but it might be. But I don't – you know, I don't know yeah. exactly. But um, Jay A told the story once about how they sent him down there to cover McNair when he was in school. He went to this restaurant and – Everybody like the, the 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 this whole aesthetic was Confederate and that the waitresses had to wear gray dresses. Oh dear. and I say had because I'm sure some of them were glad to, except that one black woman in JA saw working in that restaurant, he imagined was not so thrilled about that. He was like, Anytime he have a bad day, he'd think about that black woman in that gray uniform serving up those Colonel Red burgers. <laughs> Just be <being> like <laughs> Hey man, it could be worse. How do you ask somebody about that? How was your day at the Confederacy Shack? <laughs> bad, right? All right, welcome to Stone Walls. Uh, although I can't imagine like the irony of having a good day, right? If you're like, man, I had a good day at work at <laughs> at the Confederacy Shack. What How am I supposed to feel about that? No, it's not good. And look, that was in 1995, right? So we're not even talking <laughs> about like Lester Maddox at the Pickrick. <laughs> this was in 1995. Uh, like they had it they had internet <laughs> oh well somebody had internet something somebody tells me internet. they did not have it there <laughs> like where do you think i'd love to know like who it was the last person to the last person in america non-amish to get like the internet in some form or fashion the first the last person to hear about it like oh word huh yeah <laughs> i'm I- i'm just gonna go ahead and bet it was somebody in alaska that's it right and i bet they were thrilled well, like, I went there, I like. Okay, in 2004, it was 2004, I went to somebody's house, this is at Carolina, and they had wireless internet at the house. And I was like, whoa, so you could get the internet, like, off your laptop? Like, all the, yeah, I had no idea of wireless internet, but I have no idea when people actually got it, because I felt like the last person in the world, because everybody else knew. But I had no idea. So, like, who was the last person to be like, so I ain't got to plug the cord in? <laughs> I, this is the other thing. I think, actually, I think it was Eminem. I'm going to tell you, the last person in the world to get the internet was Eminem. I don't think it was a poor person. I don't think it was somebody who was isolated. <laughs> I think it was Eminem because there was a story in Eminem where he was showing off his vast selection of adult films to a writer. And I think this was like 2007. <laughs> I don't think it was 2007, 2008. He was showing off his vast library of adult films to a writer. And the writer said, you know, you can just get all of this on the internet. And Eminem said, What? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know <laughs> being rich had basically turned him into like an isolated islander like he <laughs> just sitting in detroit michigan in his mansion going on the internet <laughs> really <laughs> for free i wish we had started with this spencer hall <laughs> check him out fantasysociety.com best college football writer in america my man thank you so much i have enjoyed this no. greatly <laughs> Always a pleasure. Yes. Likewise. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on the right time. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Thank you to Spencer Hall. Also, thanks to our sponsors, My Computer Career and Zip Recruiter. Uh, remember, subscribe to the right time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app. 
Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The right time with Bomani Jones. <laughs> 